Do you make your decisions based on fear or based on joy? It was exactly that question that pushed me to reflect on myself and shifted my perspective on life. But in order to put that into perspective, let's take a trip down memory lane. When I was a little child, I was, as most kids are, curious about everything. So naturally, I asked my parents uh, a thousand obnoxious questions about everything. So one day, my dad started turning the tables and started asking me a bunch of questions about everything. And by the time I was like seven or eight, my dad started asking me bigger questions like, what's the meaning of life? And at the time, I really thought, I could, if only I think hard enough, I could figure it out. I could find a logical answer to that question. <laughs> But after about three days of thinking really hard, I gave up and I told my dad, oh, you know, I don't have an answer, I'm so sorry. And much to my surprise, he didn't have an answer either. <laughs> and all this time, you know, three days is a long time for an eight-year-old, uh, I thought he was going to tell me. I thought he was going to reveal this big truth to me, you know, why are we here? What is it all about? Um, but anyway, that was just one of the big questions that he asked me. There were many, many more to come. Uh, you could kind of say that my whole childhood was like a boot camp for big life questions. Um, I guess that's also the reason why I started studying philosophy, because I'm still trying to find all the answers. <laughs> uh, which is funny, because in philosophy you rarely ever do find the answers. Most of the time you just end up with even more questions. Um, but that's a whole other story. Um, yeah, but the one question that my dad asked me that stuck with me the most would only come much later in my life, when I was already in my late teens. So let's fast forward from my childhood to my teenage years. Uh, for me, uh, high school wasn't the most pleasant experience of my life. Uh, anyone else? Yeah. yeah, I know, what a shocker. <laughs> um, so there was this one day at school, I, I think I was 17, I was sitting in my math class, and my high school teacher was calculating a differential equation on the front board. And I think you can imagine how excited I was about that. <laughs> um, anyway, she went on calculating, and I was never really good at math, so I also didn't have much motivation to pay attention to it. Uh, so instead of paying attention, my mind just started drifting off further and further away into my own world. Uh, I'm sure many of you have had this experience when everything is so boring that your mind just starts daydreaming. <laughs> um, meanwhile, my mind has drifted off so much that the everyday learning situation has become surreal for me, you know, like a painting from Salvador Dali. What the woman in front of me is doing doesn't make sense to me anymore. At that point, I don't even hear, hear what she's saying. I only hear far away mumbling. But the fascinating thing in this situation is and was, and that's what I would like to share with you here, is that triggered by boredom, the lack of relationship and isolation in class, my ability to observe and, inf and reflect increased. Unintentionally, I experienced some form of mindfulness. I was suddenly able to look at myself from the outside without any difficulty. In this silence of observation, I was able to perceive new things that were not clear to me before. This enabled me spontaneously to, uh, at the moment, to observe and recognize all my background feelings and also to assign concrete names to them. What I was discovering was that 99% of all these background feelings were unfortunately negative. Fear of being spoken to, fear of being called to the board, fear of being looked down upon by my classmates, fear that they would judge me, fear that I would fail this school year, <laughs> fear that I wouldn't be able to finish school at all, like so many of other of my classmates who just dropped out because they couldn't handle it anymore. Fear that I would be devalued by friends and parents. Fear that I would be ostracized. 
please feel free to add like another hundred fears to that because that's what I was discovering. Back then, I felt so miserable and powerless and out of a lack of maturity, I was blaming everybody else. I was blaming my school and my teachers for it. I believed that all of my problems were generated by the outside world and that this is reality. Eventually, I did finish my school and I even ended up having good grades. And I felt so relieved that this horror <laughs> was finally over. But uh, some time went by and there was still all this fear. I thought once I finished school, all my fears and problems, would, they would just uh, disappear. But they just turned into new problems and new fears. And I thought, okay, maybe this is what adulthood <laughs> is like. Uh, you know, when you're a teenager, you think, oh, once I'm uh, out of here, ev everything will disappear. I will no, no longer have all these problems. But then you get to adulthood, it's not that great either. Uh, but anyway, I was just thinking, okay, this is what it is like. I will just suffer through it <laughs> like I have before, and I will get by. And you know, some time went by, and one day I was having an argument with my parents. And that's when my dad asked me, do you make your decisions based on fear or based on joy? It was then that I realized that I was li living in a totally fear-based reality. All these decisions up until now, big life decisions and also small, everyday decisions, so many of them were based on fear. I realized how much this had screwed up my life for me and joy and everyone around me. This question woke me up because it pushed me to reflect on myself and therefore work on myself, my thoughts and my reality. It was the beginning for me to really change my thinking and my actions. I became more mindful of my negative thoughts and what I was doing for my mental health. I went on a journey on tackling this negativity and work for a joyful mindset. I think that all of us, whether you are in school or on this planet, you should ask yourself this question and hopefully make the decision to work on getting into a joy-based reality. Since I'm not the only one dealing with life, uh, I want to share with you some things that help me switch from a fear-based reality to a joy-based reality. So here are my top pieces, pieces of wisdoms or tools, whatever you want to call them, that have helped me over the years and that I think you can really benefit from. Uh, so, my first point is, your thoughts are not real, or not really real. Reality is created by us. What we think about the world and what we think is true is created by us. Is the glass half empty or is it half full? If I say the glass is half full, that is correct. If I say the glass is half empty, that is also correct. That depends on what you think about it. You see, your thoughts are not the ultimate truth, but they can become so. Therefore, we must learn to intervene and question them early. Thoughts, and especially negative thoughts and fears, do not always reflect the real world. Most of the time, it's just a negative psychological anticipation or projection into a future that does not yet exist. Fears do not live in reality itself, but in our subjective consciousness. So they can never be true in the here and now, even though it often seems very convincing. Which leads me to my next point. The here and now is the sanctuary and the only truly safe place for each of us in this universe. Even if you have the worst fears and worries, you can always escape from any negative thoughts about the future into the here and now. If a thought turns into a panic attack, for example, I won't make it this school year, I will fail this exam, everyone is going to judge me, and so on and on, then you need an anchor in order to recognize this as insanity. 
Like in the movie Inception, Leonardo DiCaprio, he has this spinning top. And if it falls over, it tells him whether he is dreaming or not. So he can then wake up. You see where I'm going with this? Um, my next point is, the best anchor is to redefine negative thoughts. Please, anchor every negative feeling as not real. So when a negative thought pops up in your mind, instead of believing it right away, you have the opportunity to question it first. Like with all the things, the more you practice doing this, the easier it will become for you. To prevent any negative thought from becoming a downward spiral uh, that leads to even more negative thoughts. Training this form of mindfulness will make it so much easier for you to keep your thoughts in check and prevent your brain from going on this autopilot of negative thoughts. Older generations, like my grandmother, still accept this belief that, you know, you have some good days and you have some bad days, and there's nothing you can do. That's just the way it is, you know, that's, that's life. Uh, I'm saying that we are totally able to reconstruct our belief system and change the way we handle our thoughts and our thinking about reality. We just have to recognize it and not dismiss negative thoughts as normal or God-given. My next point, and this is my, uh, that the, one, the point that I really urge you to do is Stop complaining. Please, break with any form of complaining. And I, I'm not talking about venting your thoughts. I think this is absolutely necessary sometimes and can be very liberating or help you to reflect on situations. I'm talking about the classic mindless complaints. Think about the ratio of, of how many times a day we complain and how many times a day we express gratefulness. We complain so often, we don't even notice anymore. Complaints are like toxic, the, the complaints are toxic. They're like bugs in our software that rob us of every energy and distort our perception. Even when it seems justified, complaints drain our batteries and immediately reduce our enjoyment of life and our performance. Many people and cultures also allow this bad habit to continue. People complain because they're still too inexperienced, unconscious, and immature to observe themselves and situations from above and look at themselves calmly and simply observing. Most cultures, uh, most cultures have five common unconscious motives for complaints that in fact are all fear-based. Uh, the first attempt uh, is the first motive is to attempt to make contact. Complaining is an immature attempt to connect with others. Complaints reduce the risk of being rejected because they have a high social acceptability. For example, and this is a classic, when we complain about the weather, it's not because we're trying to share like, you know, groundbreaking new information, we're just trying to connect. The second one is re rejecting responsibility. We complain in order to justify ourselves, especially in matters of poor performance. We use complaints to justify our behavior so we can project responsibility onto other people or circumstances and to lower expectations. For example, I couldn't do it because I didn't have enough time. Or it was whatever it was, it was somebody else's fault. The third one is the suggestion of false superiority. Complaints and negative remarks about others, for example, when you're gossiping, are in fact attempts to enhance oneself with this know-it-all attitude. Complaints that are deprecating are very effective in situations that cannot be verified. You know, when you're talking about someone's behind someone's back, that's so, a so-called sniper behavior. The fourth one is the problem description. We are often unnecessarily complaining, uh, complicating issues to cover up our lack of competence. So we complain in order to stay in, in our comfort zone because we are afraid of real change and giving up the victim role. The fifth one is the resistance to new feelings, learning and development. Complaints are well-disguised rational analysis to avoid having to feel anything. Complaints are also oftentimes radical refusals uh, to accept personal development and learning. 
If we simply stop complaining, we automatically end up, as I did, in a wave of gratitude. I can now also be very thankful for the time as a teenager when I wasn't able to feel that way, because that's the reason why I'm here today. <laughs> This feeling of gratitude and joy can recharge my batteries incredibly fast, and it makes me ten times more cheerful, confident, and capable, which also dramatically increases the likelihood of success in my favor. Strictly speaking, we all live in an incredibly privileged situation, on an incredibly beautiful planet. Some of you may believe that you have earned the right, uh, that you've earned a happy life just like that, without doing anything. And I'm saying, indeed you do. And we also have to earn it for ourselves and help ourselves by working on recognizing our negative thoughts as wrong, questioning, questioning them, and stop complaining. In fact, that costs us absolutely nothing. And yet everything we have, mindfulness. It took a daily practice uh, to turn my distress around, and today, according to my state of practice, I can truly say I have earned to live in a joy-based world, and all of you too. Thank you. <laughs>